We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thanks for the invitation uh, for this symposium. Today, I'm going to talk about using stem cells to study human origins. So we started this work by asking a question, how is the human brain distinct from other primates? And uh, we know that human brains have increased in, uh, neurons have increased in dritic branching. We know that there's increased spine density on the neurons, there is enlarged cortex, and we also know that there is a delayed maturation of neurons in human brains. And that delayed maturation is also called the neoteny. So we have observed neoteny in cortical growth, cell cycle length, and dendritic spine maturation, amongst other things. So we wanted to look at systems to uh, understand this uh, aspect of this delayed protracted neuronal maturation in humans. And there are different systems in which you can look at that uh, from looking at the DNA to postmortem brain tissues, to fossil evidence and to archeological evidence. Uh, we uh, wanted to focus on another system uh, where in, in which we use live cells uh, from non-human primates and humans to look at comparative uh, experiments so we can look, we can test and validate some hypotheses regarding neuronal maturation. So the stem cells can differentiate into neurons and we can look at them comparatively between humans and non-human primates and see what are the changes or the differences between cells differentiating. So the, for this to be a, a valid system, we, want, we need to know if there are differences that are detectable at the cellular level uh, that will be relevant to understanding changes in brain size or neuronal maturation in humans. Are there uh, changes that we can identify in the cell that would be relevant for uh, the individual? And early on, we uh, to, to generate the resources for this work, we uh, used induced pluripotent stem cells. We generated induced pluripotent stem cells from chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, which are um, our closest living relatives. And we also show that cells from uh, non human primates, from those apes, were able to differentiate in vitro from the induced pluripotent stem cells, and uh, they express neuronal markers that were typical from the de de developmental stage, such as the ones indicated here, MAP2, TG1, synapsin, and they also expressed cortical markers. So we were able to generate cortical-like neurons in culture from non-human primates. So a question we had is, and it's one way that we could look at neuronal maturation from this, uh, starting from the stem cells, was to look at neuronal activity. So to detect neuronal activity from the different species comparatively, we use the system called multi-electrode array platform. So that system allow us to detect 
extracellular voltage changes that are associated with electrical events, here shown by uh, those blinking dots. So those were neurons that are firing uh, um, action potentials. So our first uh, analysis show that when we look at earlier during development, humans uh, are uh, generate a certain uh, amount of activity and every trace here corresponds to a, an, an activity of a neuron. So that's when a neuron fire, that's why we see a trace. And we compare that to chimpanzees and bonobos. And initially what we see is chimpanzees and bonobos here in red uh, are uh, differentiating more um, they were quicker at differentiation compared to human neurons. But later on during differentiation, and that's come when you look at six weeks now of an neuronal differentiation, we those same neurons are now firing more rapidly. So they were differentiating more, uh, they were more differentiated, firing more action potentials and more mature compared to chimpanzees and bonobo. But we notice that delayed maturation uh, that uh, uh, we also uh, call the protracted development or neoteny in human neurons cultured in a dish. So now we have a system in which we can study neoteny in the dish. So we then ask the question, what are the genetic drivers for neoteny? So what is, can we identify those, uh, uh, the genetic drivers that would allow for this delay of human neuronal maturation? maturation? And there are different um, drivers, potentially different genetic drivers. And one of them will be gene duplications. And there are a number of studies uh, over the years that have shown that humans have uh, uh, unique uh, gene duplications that could be uh, some of, responsible for some of the genetic drivers for human neoteny and other genetic uh, candidates for genetic drivers for, of human neoteny could be related to gene regulation. So transcription uh, factors uh, bind to specific sites in human uh, genes and those sites could be evolving different in humans compared to non-human primates. So you still have the same transcription factor, but the binding sites will be different. So we could potentially detect that by uh, uh, looking at uh, differential expression profiles. So uh, the, there is evidence that there is positive selection of transcription factor binding sites, and that's indicated uh, in, in this paper. So that suggests that the transcription factor binding sites may be evolving new functions in humans. You can still use the same transcription factor, but the binding sites in the DNA might be different. So with that in mind, we, we uh, ask the question if changes in gene regulation in humans compared to non-human primates uh, could be a component of human neuronal neoteny. And for that, we looked at differential gene expression in humans compared to non-human primates. And here uh, we use uh, a system that we differentiated uh, the induced pluripotents themselves that we had from humans, bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, and rhesus, and we differentiated them uh, in neuroprogenitors, here, here uh, uh, called N NPCs, uh, and we also differentiated them further into neurons at different times uh, during differentiation, uh, um, we looked at two, four, six, and eight weeks, and then we looked at RNA uh, profiles. So what RNA uh, those cells were producing at those different times during development. So our first uh, uh, question was, uh, are the, the neuronal progenitors transitioning to neurons in a conserved way? So we, are we generating uh, a human, gorilla, chimp, bonobo, uh, rhesus neurons in the same way. And it turns uh, out that all species do transition similarly from neuroprogenitors to neurons. And we can see uh, um, evidence for uh, examples of genes here, for instance, uh, CDK1, which is a gene related to progenitors. So when you compare a progenitor, which is a neuronal progenitor that is still dividing, you see that gene uh, that is more upregulated and it downsregulated uh, similarly to all species during differentiation when we're looking at neurons. A similar thing happens to synapsin 1, but on the opposite side. So synapsin 1 is a typical uh, gene expressed in neurons. Uh, so we will see it uh, more uh, less expressed in uh, neuroprogenitor cells, but when, when you differentiate into neurons, uh, the expression of synapsin grows. And that's comparable between all species. So we are able to generate uh, neurons and in, in, uh, the, the transitions are very uh, 
comparable between human and non-human primates. Also, um, the, 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 spa the, spatial, the spatial enrichment of the genes in neuroprogenitors and in neurons is very comparable. So that's telling us that we can make neurons from uh, human and non-human primates in very similar ways. But yet, there are some differences. So what are the differences? So one of the uh, differences and a way in which we can look at those differences is by doing an analysis called the principal component analysis using the full transcriptome. And when we do that, so that allows us, this type of analysis allows us to um, summarize a lot of uh, data from one cell line and reduce it to one dot. So for instance, the triangle here will indicate this, uh, the whole transcriptome of that one cell line. And in that way, we're able to compare a lot of data and, uh, in, and summarize it in a figure. So what this figure is showing us is when you look at, when you compare the full transcriptome from uh, all the species that we uh, tested, uh, the transcriptome recapitulates phylogeny. And that means uh, human is uh, clustering, all the humans are clustering together, the chimpanzees and the bonobos are clustering together, followed by the gorillas, and the rhesus is an outer group. So that's uh, uh, also uh, important to us. That also means that our in our cellular system is representing to some extent what's happening in, to the species, to the living species. So what we did then is uh, we performed a weighted correlation network analysis, which is another type of analysis that will identify the top correlated upregulated genes in human specific networks. So here we're looking for things that are human uh, specific, for, for genes that are uh, uh, human specific and are upregulated in humans. So there are a number of genes that are identified, but one of our top uh, upregulated genes is called GATA3. And we uh, can see here in more detail that over differentiation time, so zero will be the progenitor, and then we have two, four, six, and eight weeks, GATA3 goes up during the earlier uh, stages of differentiation in humans, so that's a green uh, uh, trace here, and it stays up uh, over the course of the differentiation compared to the other non-human primates. So we see in this analysis that GATA3 is correlated with genes that are uniquely regulated in humans by looking at the transcriptome. Um, so we, we got uh, very excited when we saw GATA3 as an, one of our top regulators because that manuscript that I showed you before, uh, published a number of years ago now in Nature Genetics, uh, also showed that GATA3 was one of their top uh, uh, transcription factors wh whose the binding sites have show were showing uh, uh, the strongest evidence for positive selection. So we confirm we wanted to confirm that GATA3 expression was increased. So we confirmed that uh, increase in expression of the GATA3 protein in, in human cells compared to non-human cells, both or chimp, bonobo, gorilla, and rhesus. Um, didn't express GATA3. And we also show that uh, in postmortem brain using uh, Allen Brain Atlas, we show that uh, GATA3, uh, we pull the data showing that uh, humans have increased expression of uh, GATA3 compared to, to rhesus. So both uh, in on neurons that we were culturing the dish as well as in brains, postmortem brains, GATA3 was all upregulated in human cells. So we noticed that GATA3 is increased in human in vitro and in prenatal brain. Now we wanted to know, um, it's a, so since GATA3 is a, a, we are proposing that it's a human specific uh, uh, regulator uh, of um, certain um, sequences in the genome. Uh, one way in which we can uh, look at what GATA3, uh, which genes GATA3 is binding is to use a technique called uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation, followed by sequencing. So that technique allows us to uh, look at which uh, genes, uh, areas, which sequences in the genome, the, the transcription factor of choice, which in this case is GATA3, which areas GATA3 is actually binding to in the genome. So we, when we do that in our cell lines, we notice that there was an enrichment of GATA3 on promoter regions and five prime UTR of genes, which is something that would be expected as a characteristic of a transcription factor. 
And we notice a number of genes, and here is an example of a gene called Notch. 2 and L that has enrichment of GATA3 signal at the 5 prime UTR. Additionally, we noticed that there was a spatial enrichment of GATA3 bound genes on the area of a, a called sub subventricular zone when you looked at 15 uh, postconceptional weak old postmortem human brain, meaning that uh, GATA3 uh, bound genes are also enriched in uh, uh, that area where neurons are, um, newborn neurons are differentiating into. Uh, migrating and differentiating into uh, more mature neurons. Uh, additionally, we noticed that the binding sites we detected using that uh, uh, technique called chromatin immunoprecipitation, uh, followed by sequencing, those sites uh, were located uh, in areas in the neurons and they are under positive selection in humans. We use that same algorithm that uh, Arbiza et al. in Nature Genetic used in the past. So with that uh, uh, experiment, we concluded that GATA3 binds to unique sites in human neurons that are under positive selection. We wanted to know what knockdown of GATA3 would, would do, uh, and we wanted to ask the question if it would be inhibiting human-specific expression. So we generated cell lines that were using uh, SH RNA again against GATA3. We decreased the expression, we're able to decrease the expression of GATA3, and we wanted to uh, uh, both in protein and RNA, we wanted to look at what would be the consequences of that. So, uh, so here is a, 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 the, that same type of plot, uh, a principal component analysis, uh, where we uh, are specifically, we, invo we included all species, but we are only looking at genes that are identified as GATA3 regulated within humans. So when we look at a principal component analysis, uh, including only this, uh, uh, the genes that I, I mentioned that are GATA3 regulated, we can see that uh, humans uh, are uh, clearly uh, um, separated from the other uh, non-human primate species. Now, what happens when we now uh, uh, plot human cells that in which we have decreased expression of GATA3? So look at uh, what happens now, the, the black symbols change their uh, position in principal component analysis, especially in principal component analysis uh, two, so the Y axis, uh, to a, a location that is more uh, uh, similar to where bonobos and chimps, uh, non-human primates are located. And another way to visualize that is to uh, uh, plot the same values that would be that are plotted on the PCA. Those are called uh, eigenvalues, and we uh, and, and show them separately what what is happening on, on PC one, uh, which is the y x, and PC two, sorry, PC one, which is the x uh, axis, and PC two, which is the y x. So while PC one that is not much changed, so the black box plot uh, are the cells that have been treated with SH against GATA3, so decreasing GATA3 doesn't change the profile uh, much. Uh, um, what, when you look in PC2, what you see is uh, there is a clear decrease of uh, the box plot that is related to uh, SH, uh, uh, that was treated with SH GATA3, and now it's comparable uh, with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos compared to where it was before GATA3 treatment. And that we also wanted to show some examples of human specific expression patterns that are uh, expressed more similar in non-human primate samples after treatment with SH GATA3. So SH GATA3 uh, uh, is able to change expression of some of the genes. The lack of GATA3 changed the expression of some of genes to a more similar expression to what you see in non-human primates. And here's an example of uh, TMEM260 uh, and uh, CTNNAL1, uh, where treatment with SH uh, GATA3 uh, changes the expression of the genes to more similar to the levels that are expressed in non-human primates. And we have also other examples of genes that shift uh, that shift in human expression to a more pain-like state after uh, knockdown. So we, we, with this, with those experiments, we um, are suggesting that GATA3 regulates a component of the transcription that distinguishes human neurons from pen neurons. Uh, our other question were, was, would that 
uh, now that we can we notice that there is a change, do we have uh, do we see any uh, differences in the physiological maturity uh, rate in human neurons? And that uh, we have uh, to remind us we have seen what we have seen before is that a protracted development. Uh, maturation in human neurons. So human neurons here in green uh, are delayed uh, uh, maturation compared to chimpanzees and bonobos. We have shown that uh, before. Uh, and what we um, uh, looked at, we're looking here is the same parameters, which is the mean firing rate, as well as uh, bursts, which are indicatives, indicators of neuronal maturity. And when we look here at the uh, uh, red uh, squares uh, that I'm highlighting, you can see humans treated with, uh, human neuron treated with SH against GATA3 uh, compared to untreated or, or humans treated with uh, SH control. You see that there is an increase in uh, uh, activity in those neurons. And we can uh, see a plot here showing uh, in black an increased activity for both uh, uh, parameters of the mean firing rate as well as number of neuronal births, both parameters that indicate neuronal maturity. So the absence of removing GATA3 speeds up the maturation of human neurons. So GATA3 presence acts to delay the rate of maturity of spontaneous action potentials. And we think that uh, uh, this is a key aspect of human uh, neoteny. So GATA3 is involved in uh, that process. So uh, to summarize uh, and conclude, I hope uh, uh, you uh, saw evidence that GATA3 is uniquely upregulated in human neurons in comparison to other non-human primates. I hope you also um, understood that GATA3 is bound to genes that display human-specific dynamics. GATA3 binding sites are under positive selective pressure in human neurons. GATA3 regulates a component of transcription that distinguished human neurons from PAN, and GATA3 acts to delay the maturity of spontaneous action potentials, and that's a key aspect of human neoteny. And to conclude, we think that our findings underscore the importance of identifying how human specific gene regulation is brought into an already functional transcriptional network of an organism, potentially through the coevolution of transcription factor binding sites. So the that uh, the idea that if you can you can still keep the same uh, uh, regulations, but if you change the binding sites or you have new binding sites, you can uh, you're able to change um, important aspects of neuronal maturation. And with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge our collaborators. Uh, Rusty Gage from the Salk Institute, Katerina Simondeferi uh, from UCSD, uh, and uh, people that were more direct, directly involved in, with this work. Um, Sarah Linker is the lead author. Renata Santos are also, also very uh, involved. Uh, and we also had uh, support from Inigo Narvaisa, Mayan Wang, Amandeep Sharma, Anna Mendes, Ruth Opner, and Lynn Moore. And thank you so much. Thank you.